So it. tell us then about fighting the F-15 yeah. against friendly, um, dissimilar air, ty- air, air combat types. So, so right. um, you know, the, the, the big question I have in my mind is that when people talk about the F- F-15, they, they talk about, you know, 104, 105 kills to, to nil, that kind of stuff. You know, it, it's the world's greatest air superiority fighter, um, you know, indomitable, uh, unbeaten. Was it truly that? So if you were flying against an F-14 or you were flying against an F-18 or an F-16, where were you strong and, and where were you weak? Um, you know, were there times where you were humbled? Uh, were there times where, you know, it was to do with limitations with the aeroplane or is it is it always about the pilot? Just give us a, you know, your, your perspective right. on how that all works. Well, let's start off with this humility aspect that you mentioned because, as you know, it's very hard to be humble. <laughs> when you're flying an airplane as superior, at least in its day and age, superior to, to all comers, so to speak. Um, so, uh, and, and you also mentioned the word relative to, and, and that's what it really is all about. It, it's our airplane, what airplane you're flying relative to your opponent. Uh, they all have very uh, capabilities derived from either their flight envelope their weapon suite, their their sensor suite that allows the pilot and the, and the uh, other crew members of so, uh, more than one uh, single seat, uh, more, than, uh, more than a single seat um, type uh, adversary. Um, so you want to obviously use your uh, greatest assets uh, to your advantage and and minimize the ones that are, are relatively weak, as you said, uh, against your op- opponents. Um, the, um, when the F-15 was in its heyday in the 80s and 90s, uh, until the arrival of the Flanker, um, there really was no airplane that could, could compare with it in every regime of combat. And by regime, I mean from BVR, beyond visual range, the location of the enemy airplanes and the ability to shoot them before they could shoot you and the ability to, to get out of the uh, dire situation as you were approaching the merge, the visual arena. So that that's one regime. The other regime, of course, is the uh, visual arena itself, which is boils down to dogfighting. Uh, and finally, there's the, uh, the, uh, the getaway factor. Uh, the third regime is being able to, to leave a... Uh, a combat on your own terms uh, and get away successfully. So to take those, uh, if, if the, the smart fighter pilots will take those, you know, when they're facing a, a, a dissimilar adversary, take those and see what their, the advantages are and exploit them. For instance, the radar range of the F-15 in the 80s uh, exceeded all except for the Tomcat. But the Tomcat, its AUG-9 uh, system, was designed to get bombers, bear bombers, badgers, and uh, carrying anti-shipping uh, cruise missiles and, and other you know, maritime operations uh, weaponry. <laughs> and so it would, it, so it, it had some uh, some very large blind zones because it was tuned, if you will, to a certain speed, and it's looked down. Uh, capabilities required a, a flat surface uh, ground return, meaning water, so that the radar would not be, the radar uh, echoes would not be returned to the transmitting antenna, but it would bounce off beyond the target into space. So over land, it could not, it didn't really have a, an effective look down sheet down capability. Um, the, uh, so the other thing was that the Phoenix, uh, was again a bomber destroyer missile, uh, and there was a lot of intricacies in it that made it effective in that role. But because it uh, required updates to track the in, the in, approaching uh, target, if that target uh, changed course, and as the AUG nine was was uh, time sharing against several targets, because the Soviets were not going to send a, sol- a solitary bomber against a carrier task force. There would be multiples. 
So the radar would share, well, all the targets that saw it would share time with each one. Well, if a target changed course by as little as five degrees and was not at the expected uh, location when the radar returned to, to reacquire it and data and uh, updated statically to for that target, then it went blind. It just dropped that target. So because because the nature of its design, uh, if you were approaching the, the uh, an F fourteen as adversaries and you were lower than them, then it then at certain points just a 10, 15 degree check turn. One way or another, you could still maintain progress towards the, the Tomcats, but you could defeat their radar because you would not be where the radar expected to see you at its next look. So anyway, th th that's probably a lot, a lot of technicalities to just say that the F-15, although it had a, its radar was not as powerful and as long range as a Tomcat, still you could get in close, close enough to employ ordnance. Um, Without without uh, the Tomcat call, uh, um, calling a, uh, I can't remember what, what their, they had a call for Washington Phoenix, uh, like Brutus or Bruno or like you were sicking a, uh, a Rottweiler on, a, on an unsuspecting child. Uh, so, so anyway, so, and, and of course, all other airplanes, the F-15 could get in close. Uh, the F-4 had no look-down capability. Uh, the F-18, uh, when it came out after the, the Eagle, uh, it had about two-thirds because of, because it's, the electrical generators on its engines could not provide the same level of power, the same amperage of the electrons that are sent into the air. Then its, its uh, radar was limited by the, the power output of the engines, of the radar, which is driven by the engines uh, generated. So you had about a, let, let's uh, just arbitrarily say that an FFT, an F4, an F15 could see 40 miles. F18, probably 25 to 30. So you had a, at least 12 miles in there to, to find the target and figure out how you wanted to attack him before, he, before you ever showed up on his radar. The F-16, the early model of the F-16, same problem. A single engine and it's and a small radar dish in the nose, then its uh, effective uh, search range was about 50% of the F-15. So so if an F-15 can see 40 miles, the Viper could see 20. Well, you can do a lot of things and, and before you get to 20 miles to ensure that you're going to, uh, to intercept them, you know, as far off the nose as possible, because uh, that's where those guys would be looking. So anyway, so in the BBR environment, you compare radar ranges and you compare effective missile uh, flyout ranges, because uh, you want to have the you want to you want to go fast, shoot first, and check six. Those are the uh, the uh, trifecta of you know, uh, the litany, if you will, of uh, how you approach a, a fight. Uh, go fast. <laughs> shoot first and then uh, check six the uh the bb the bfm of, in uh visual arena of course is uh is a lot more dynamic not nearly as um shall we call it engineering in other words using uh, numbers ranges asthmas altitude deltas and those sorts of things to figure out where you do have an advantage um uh, but more of the um you know, the the turning uh, capabilities of the airplanes. Um, to go back to to the Tomcat, the Tomcat was uh, again it was designed as a as a, uh, a bomber destroyer, specifically a bomber carrying uh, uh, anti ship missiles. Uh, the uh, the the swing wing, the uh, variable geometry wing, wasn't so much for combat maneuvering as it was to get swung forward to get such a heavy airplane off the deck of a carrier uh, in a catapult launch and back on the deck of a carrier safely. So that's why the wings come out, right? Uh, uh, and when they are out, then that gives, uh, that gives uh, the airplane more lift uh, uh, and therefore in BFM engages more turning capability. 
faster nose rate in terms of uh, turning. Uh, a lot of people would say that that, it, that that gave the airplane an advantage. Well, not over the F-15 or the F-16 or the F-18. Uh, maybe perhaps a little bit over the F-4. The, um, the, um, what it uh, really did uh, uh, was it gave, its, it gave itself an advantage over what it would be like if the wings were back, like as a, as a delta. So, so the relative thing there is, yes, and that's why, and that's why the, uh, the swing wing was so advantageous for the Tomcat to go after bear bombers because you needed to intercept them before they lost their cruise missiles which meant you needed a lot of speed to get as far out away from the carriers to intercept them before they could launch the cruise missiles. Mm. So, uh, so that's, that, that's why the F-14 has its, its uh, swing wing uh, uh, technology. The problem with it in terms of uh, BFM is one of the settings on the wings is uh, the maneuvering setting. And I, uh, you get to see a little bit of that in the first Top Gun movie where the wing will come out from its delta, its high-speed delta configuration. It will start coming out to maintain the best leftover drag ratio for the airplane uh, at that speed, that altitude, and that weight. Well, it, fighting the F with the F-15, we, we typically would be able to get in close, uh, get within visual range uh, before they could actually start employing ordnance. Uh, and after the first pass, the F-15 could do, we could square a corner. We could square a corner once. Uh, and we could square a corner, get behind his uh, uh, his uh, 39 line, and then you could you could just watch as as the F-14 would be going into a, into a turn, the wings would be progressively swinging out. We refer to that as the uh, the great airspeed indicator in the sky, because it told you what his energy level was. By the time the wings got perpendicular to the airframe, he was close to virtually on stall. And then all you have to do is throttle back, saddle up, and turn on the gun. <laughs> so so now uh, and because of that, the uh, the F-14 was known as the turkey rather than the tomcat. Because it, it was big, heavy, bulky, that had, had little bitty wings that would come out at trying to fly, um, kind of like a T Rex, you know, trying to tr trying to play poker, uh, and uh, and so uh, so that was the, that's how you would evaluate the Tomcat. The F sixteen, on the other hand, that thing could harden my fighter pilot vernacular, but it could fly up its own asshole. <laughs> so if you wanted to avoid getting into a turning fight with an F-16. So it was just like uh, when in early in, in the, the Second World War, when the uh, democracies typically had airplanes that were not as maneuverable as our, as our adversaries, you learn to do hit and run tactics. Again, stay fast, shoot first, and check six. Uh, when the F-16 before Amram, the Amram was the great equalizer among all air air fighters. Uh, if if you could if you could get it, uh, so in, before AMRAP, all you had to do was stay outside of an AIM nine envelope. So so you hit the merge, and if you had if you did not have advantage, and the advantage because this is the visual arena, the advantage is if they don't see you, if they don't see you, press the attack. If they do see you, they're reacting to you. It's an aware bandit. Then uh, find an exit into the third regime, and that is to leave on your own terms. Don't stay and try to BFM because, uh, and I'm 16, because if you met 180 out and both of you went into a turn, then the, the next the next merge, he would have about 30 angles on it. It's still, it's looking promising, especially if you're using the vertical effectively. Uh, but remember, the F-16 has the same thrust to weight ratio, very high, uh, that the eagle does. So, so if you take the fight up, he's going to go up with you. If you take the fight down, your turn radius is going to get larger as you can uh, accelerate downhill. And and he, because it's the fly by wire system, has got an optimized wing. Uh, then he's going to he's going to sustain the same uh, 
turn radius at high cheese. So mm-hmm. that's not leaving on your own terms. So anyway, so so that's the uh, the um, the difference between BVR, shall we say, against the Tomcat and BFM against the Tomcat versus uh, BFM versus Viper. Every time we went to uh, the similar, um, I guess the similar NATO adversaries, adversaries in the training sets, for instance, the Mirage F1, we would we would research in the, in the squadron weapon shop, we would research the uh, flight envelope, the weapon sweep, the uh, radar, Look, uh, all of the all of the pertinent uh, items uh, about the adversary, and then we would, what we would try to do for our own training is is decide what Soviet airplane that it best replicated. What well, which one did it match most closely? Uh, for instance, the Mirage F one and the French uh, F one that we we trained against in uh, in France. But then fought against it in Iraq. Um, it best replicated a MiG twenty three. The radar uh, parameters that that it possessed were very similar. Uh, uh, there were some uh, similarities with the uh, with uh, the radar missile. The Aphid was a lot like a Magic in terms of its envelope or turning capability, although it was smaller because it's a smaller rocket motor. Uh, so we would go against it, not just to you know pound our chest and go, oh, we beat you, we beat you, but to get ba- valid and valuable training out of each encounter. Well, I flew against um, lightnings at um, up at Bibro, and that was like that was like fighting a MiG twenty one. That's how we we looked at it, and and then you know certain visual aspects and say, oh yeah, it, it even looks like one, but just a notch out of the wing. Uh, but it's very similar to the uh, to uh, the later models of, of MiG twenty one. Uh, so, so I don't mean to put down um, you know everybody uh, in any way. It's just that each has its own advantages uh, and disadvantages in and of itself inherent, uh, which we tr- try to exploit the disadvantages um, and um, and enhance our own advantages. So, I hope that kind of covers the waterfront for back then. The MiG-29 are arriving on the scene. Uh, as I might have mentioned last time, intelligence, um, Air Force Intelligence built that airplane up as uh, as as the eagle beater. Uh, and as it turns out, no, not so much. Uh, it, it, uh, it it had a lot of limitations that, uh, that we were not initially aware of. Uh, and I fought them at Cold Lake, one of my last deployments um, uh, up there, Maple Flag, um, and, and it, it had a, a really uh, it, ergonomics were awful, and it, it, uh, it it's really a wonder that they they saw anything uh, either on the radar or visually. Uh, but anyway, even that we would go to school on okay, how to fight the MiG twenty nine. Because it was really very little more than than a uh, an F four weapons radar wep- radar and weapons capability uh, mounted in a small version a, a scaled down version of a Tomcat configuration with the engines two engines in pods carried beneath the flat belly uh, and, and that sort of thing. It did not have the turning you know, performance of an F sixteen. Although Intel said it was going to, didn't. Um, anyway, so it it, take, it takes study. Uh, fighter pilots are not known for being smart, uh, but uh, you know we get if we get smarter after, after you know we have a few. But uh, but uh, we're intelligent enough to know that uh, we're going to win this fight and win meaning is coming back alive. Then uh, then you got you got to know your adversary, everything about them, and what cards you have in your hand that you can play to uh, to uh, get back alive, if not bring back you know back some kills or part of the process. 